أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد uh, We're still in part two of our series of lectures uh, speaking about the main uh, Shia or the main Islamic Sunni reformist scholars in our era we started by mentioning the leader of the reformist scholars in the Sunni school of thought in our era, uh, being Sayyid Jamaluddin al-Afghani. And although he is classified by many as a Shia, but his movement was in the Sunni uh, gov- uh, countries. Then the second scholar that we spoke about last week is Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. Sheikh Muhammad Abdu was the disciple of Sayyid Jamaluddin, yani one of his best students. What's interesting in this reformation movement in the Sunni school of thought in our era, that it started uh, as a small uh, group by Sayyid Jamaluddin. And the whole institution stood against his movement, the movement of Sayyid Jamaluddin. He struggled a lot. However, we find that the fruit of his movement appeared on the hands of his student, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, who was able with all his unorthodox views to reach a position where he became the head of the Islamic institution back then, which is Al-Azhar, the main Sunni Islamic institution. This is something very important to reflect upon, to see how the reformation or the modern movement in the Sunni school of thought moved from a position of weakness, from being a small group, into the position of being in power and becoming the head of the institution. Um, It should be clear that when someone becomes in the position of power or they have power in their hands, they will have more um, uh, places or uh, more chances of implementing the reformation views. When you're not in a position of power, you can present theories. But who listens to these theories that you give? Not many. Great scholars who are very well known in Islam, as we will see, inshallah, in part three, when we go to the Shia uh, scholars, great scholars who are very well respected, no one listened to their views to the reformation uh, views. So if someone doesn't have this position or this uh, recognition in the institution, obviously no one will listen to his uh, theories. Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, with all the uh, unorthodox views and with all his ag- uh, aggressive approach against the institution, he became the head of it. For example, he used to refer to Al-Azhar institution as a house, he used to call it Al-Istabal. Al-Istabal is the house for donkeys and horses, to that extent. And he says in one of his interviews that it took me 10 years to clean my head from the rubbish that I was taught in Al-Azhar institution. 10 years. So he, I was very aggressive and negative against the institution and with that, the reformation movement was able to reach a position of power. Now, after uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, we can mention a third scholar. Now, obviously there are other scholars in the Sunni school of thought other than say Jamaluddin, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. And until today there are some scholars, but we're just going to mention the main three scholars in, uh, in, in the Sunni school of thought, who, who I believe they had a lot of... Uh, influence on, on the society. The third scholar is Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. His name is Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. I'll mention him for a very important reason. At the end of the lecture, it will become clear why we're mentioning him instead of other names. Muhammad Rashid Rida was born in October 1865 and died on the 22nd of August 1935. So, all the reformation movement, as you see, it's at the end of the 1800s. 
right, the beginning of the 1900s. This is where the Reformation movement and the Sunni school of thought took place. Uh, he was a Syrian Islamic reformist from Syria, whose thoughts influenced the 20th century uh, Islamic thinkers. It is said that Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida was one of the most influential and controversial scholars of his generation. And he attracted a lot of people towards him. He was deeply influenced in his early age by the Salafi movement. And also he was influenced by the uh, modernism or the reformation movement of Sayyid Jamaluddin in Egypt and Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, he has a, interest, a very interesting journey. He started as a Salafi scholar. Then he moved to become a reformer scholar. And then before he died, he returned back to the Salafi movement. And I believe he was the one that opened the door in front of Salafism to enter into modernism. The one that helped to destroy the reformation movement in the Sunni school of thought and give access to some extreme views to take place in the, in the, um, the Reformation movement was Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. But in, it's interesting to see this move or this change that took place in his life. You know, it's easy to criticize others. When you hear any view, it's easy to criticize it. When you see something done by others, it's easy to criticize it. But it's always very hard to criticize yourself. Especially intellectual self-criticism. Intellectual self-criticism is very hard. If you work for years, for years, actively, you work on presenting certain theories, presenting evidence to them, defending them. And then after eight, ten years, you wake up and you see that all the theories that you presented, all the evidence that you came up with are weak. So here it becomes very hard because when you want to criticize yourself, you have to destroy everything that you built and go back to the beginning, to the first uh, start, to the first point where you have to start from the beginning. So you're building a foundation for years and then suddenly you find out that these views are wrong, are not correct, are not strong, then you have to go back to the, to the beginning. That's very, very difficult. When you're attacking someone else, you have this uh, hate or enmity sometimes that pushes you, or jealousy that pushes you to destroy them. But to destroy yourself, that's very hard. It's similar to, let's say, if you build a house, if you build a house and someone comes and tells you destroy it, you'll find it hard because you built this house. But if you were asked to destroy someone else's house, you'll find it easier, correct? Because you didn't build this house. The same thing with knowledge. Changing the views is something very common between the active scholars. All wise, intellectual scholars change their views by time. Let it be from the Sunnis or the Shia. I'll give a few examples. For example, a Shafi'i, he changed a lot of the rulings in Fiqh uh, in, during his life from the Sunnis. From the Shia, you can see Sayyid al Khu'i, rahmatullah, he changed a lot of his views during his time. He used to believe, for example, certain things, uh, for example, Kamal al Ziyarat, this book, to be authentic. Later on, he said it's not authentic. Uh, all, all, all the book and with other views so it's normal for scholars to change their views no one can claim to have the absolute uh, reality or the absolute absolute knowledge they all study to the best of their ability some people they they find the problem in that and you know, when you present a certain view and then you change later on they use it against you Say, oh, you said that a few years ago, right? And that happens even with, with us. Like some people today, they tell us, you used to speak or preach certain things years ago. Years ago, I used to believe in that. 
I was, yani, I was if you want to say sincere in what I was saying, because this is the, my knowledge was up to that level. But you build up, every year you build up and you change. Maybe now I'm presenting certain views. In 10 years, another 10 years, <laughs> maybe the whole theories will change. You never know. You'll still have to, you always have to stay open and to intellectually uh, criticize your thoughts. Because you don't, you're not an infallible, end of the day. And also other scholars in Islam can be given as example how they change their views uh, throughout time. So Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida was one of these people that started as a Salafi. Then later on he found himself in the Reformation movement because it was trending back then. And maybe he did believe in it. And at the end of his life, I don't know, he came back to the Salafi movement. Maybe he thought, Allah, let me just stay on the safe side. Right? And go back to the uh, Salafi or the mainstream uh, uh, path. He was accused while being part of the Reformation movement of being what? Yalla, what's the accusation again? Mason. Mason. Uh, anyway, that's the heck. It's ready. The moment they want to attack someone, a Mason. So he was accused of being a Mason. Yeah, and you feel, subhanAllah, as if yeah, there's a part or there's a group inside the Freemasonry for turbans or in certain uh, agents in the West uh, MI6 and others they have a certain group just for the scholars it's like the Hausa is there just to produce people who work for, for this, uh, these groups anyone they disagree with they, he becomes Mason back then Sayyid Jamal Din was accused of this Sheikh Muhammad uh, Abdu was accused of this and Rashid Rada was accused of the same thing uh, now, when it comes to his views, and this is something very important to mention, when we mention uh, certain scholars or their views, it doesn't mean that we agree with them. Like when we mention the Sayyid Jamal al-Din, Muhammad Abdu, it doesn't mean that we agree with their views. Maybe we disagree with them. In this part of the discussion, we're just mentioning the different views. And this is something also important to keep in mind. Don't listen to these views and think that I believe in them. No, the, the, maybe I don't believe in the whole discussion that is presented. No, maybe I don't believe in Reformation altogether. I'm just presenting the different views. There's difference between uh, narrating or showing the different views and providing evidence to, to support a certain uh, view. We're not used in many places yet to presenting and listening to the different views. Usually you sit down, you present your view, you defend your view, you attack the other view, wassalamu alaikum and you leave, right? It's always like there's a debate. You want to prove yourself right, prove the other side wrong and leave. This is one way of doing it and it can be uh, positive and there's some positivity to it. But also there's another uh, type of knowledge, uh, academic knowledge, especially those who go to university and uh, Alhamdulillah, well, this generation, most of them are university students. You know that you go and you see different views. It doesn't mean that you have to show support to any of these uh, views. You're just learning about uh, what different scholars are saying. To that part, we're just learning about what other scholars say about this topic. Right? It's something important. So when you want to respond you're responding to these scholars that were mentioning their names you're not responding to me when you believe that there's something wrong it doesn't mean that i am wrong i'm not the one who's saying these views keep that in mind if you believe this approach is wrong it's not my approach it's their approach i'm just presenting if you think that it's wrong for me to present then don't listen easy <laughs> that's the easiest thing to do like i'm not forcing anyone to listen i'm not telling one uh, telling anyone to come listen I'm not in a position to teach anyone. We're just learning together. We're reading about a certain topic. Same as they have a book night in certain places. They can read the book and sit down together discussing this book. We're reading about this topic and sitting down discussing together. I'm not in a position of teaching anyone. And also, I don't see anyone in a position to teach me what, how to approach things, what to speak about, what not to speak about. That's none of your business. With all due respect, I say it's none of your business. I'll present my talk. If you don't like it, just go listen to anyone else that you like. Easy. Right. 
I have done my best to stay independent in the work that I do. And that's what I like, to be independent. And Salah should be clear before we go to the views of Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. Okay, we'll go to the views of Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. Muhammad Rashid Rida had many unorthodox and controversial views. For example, if you remember Say uh, Sayyid, uh, Sayyid, what's his name? Jamal al-Din, Sayyid Jamal al-Din, he started arguing that uh, Darwin's theory is weak. Then later on he said, it's correct. And Islam spoke about it. Correct? Yeah. Sheikh Muhammad, what's his name, Abdu also, he argued against uh, Darwin's theory for a certain time of his life. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, he believed that Darwin, Darwin's theory of evolution is correct. Sayyid Jamaluddin, he said, we only accept it with animals, not with the humans. Because the humans, they have a soul. Right? But animals, according to him, they don't have a soul which is also a weak idea. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid, he believes that evolution is correct. And he argues, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, the leader of the Islamic Sunni reformist movement during his time, used to believe that the idea of uh, the human generation or, or the human race, the idea of this human race coming from Adam is a Jewish and a Christian idea. And there's no evidence in Islam for this concept. Did he argue that when he was in charge? He was in yes, in yes, yes. He argued that. The, 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 who says that we come from Adam, the human race come, come from Adam? Adam the Prophet, alayhi salam. Yani Adam, Prophet Adam, alayhi salam. This is something that uh, the Jewish people and the Christians uh, mention. It's not. There's no evidence in the Quran. You tell him, what about Adam, the story in the Quran? There's a discussion between some scholars, especially some Sunni scholars and those who come from Al-Azhar. They say, who says to you every time the name Adam is mentioned, it's speaking about Prophet Adam, salam. Adam is a title, right? From Al-Adim, Adim from the soil, someone that is created from the soil. So you can say Adam the Prophet, and there's Adam the first human being, right? In order for you to prove that Adam, that Allah created first, is the Adam the Prophet, you need evidence for that. So who says that the Prophet Adam is the first Adam? And this is something that is common between the Sufi or the, the Arfan, Arfani people. They use this uh, statement, قَبْلَ آدَمِكُمْ هَذَا أَلْفُ Adam. They attribute it to Imam Sadiq There's no evidence for it, right? This narration. It's attributed to Imam Sadiq. Before you Adam, there's thousands of Adam. And maybe scientifically, they can prove that the life of a human race is older than what is presented in religion. And if they say, when was Adam created? How long ago? And then you say the scientific facts that come out today, maybe it shows that it's before. The, the date that religious people put down for Adam Now regardless, we're just saying that this is one of his views that he mentioned that Adam doesn't have to be Adam the Prophet. Also, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, he mentions uh, something else when it comes to the Quran, he says uh, it's possible, it's possible according to Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida to interpret certain stories of the Qur'an in a metaphorical way. Especially when it comes to the stories of the Prophet Today, this is still something uh, that is classified as uh, unorthodox. Remember when we gave our talk in the mosque and we spoke about Prophet Yunus السلام, and the whale and we mentioned this view. Some people also have a problem with that. That's in the 1800s, the scholar is presenting this view that it's possible that certain stories in the Quran can be understood in a metaphorical way. A, a physical whale that came and swallowed Yunus and traveled under the water and then he came out, you need evidence to prove that, that it happened. And also you need evidence to prove that it's a, it's a meta, metaphor. So both sides must prevent, pre present evidence for that. 
<coughs> the, the splitting of the ocean for Musa alayhi salam. Also, yeah, they need to pre present evidence for that. The slaughtering or the order of Ibrahim alayhi salam to slaughter his son. That also needs to, you need to present evidence. Whether it's a metaphor or a real story. Yeah? We're not here to take sides to say which one is right, which one is wrong. But this is some, a concept that Muhammad Rashid Rida used to believe in. Is that good so far? Mm. One of his views that is now common today, but uh, maybe in the Sunni school of thought it's not that common, he used to believe that a riba or interest can be accepted in certain uh, circumstances. For us today, it's something normal, right? Because uh, most of the maraja they came up with the uh, shara tricks for you uh, to find a way out, changing the name, doing certain things, just to make it a halal. But in the Sunni school of thought, as you know, yani, from many Sunnis that you, you see and you meet, a riba for them is a is, yani, khalas, the complete no for them. There's no way for them in, to deal with the interest. Muhammad Rashid Rida in the late 1800s, he used to believe that it's possible. To, to, to deal with the river in certain circumstances. Um, also, building idols. You know, there's many in the region, even the Shia school of thought, that it's haram to build a certain, uh, what do they call it? Statue. Yeah, statue. They say it's haram, according to some narration. According to Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, he used to believe if it's not done for the sake of worshipping, then there's no problem in it. Until today, in some uh, Sunni groups, even if you have the toys for kids, the dolls, they say there's a jinn in it, right? In some schools, even here in our country, some schools here, they, they take the eyes off the doll, and they, I don't know what they do to the doll, certain things, they put a hole in the door uh, for the jinn to, to get out of it. <clears throat> Until here in, in Sydney, there's certain Sunni schools that do that. They believe that, according to their narration, there's a jinn in it. Or if you do, if you build an idol or a statue, then you're worshiping it. It's kufr. Muhammad Rashid in the 1800, he believed that there's no problem in that. Now, another controversial thing that he did, he supported the uh, the British against the Ottomans, because he believed that the Ottomans were corrupting in the in the Islamic uh, countries. So he supported the Brit the British to come and destroy the Ottoman. And this is one of the mistakes that some scholars uh, practiced back then. <clears throat> well, there's no doubt that the Ottomans were oppressors and there's no doubt that they occupied our land. They, didn't, they were not supervising it. It's not their land because until today they believe it's a Turkish land. In their dreams, their Turkish land is some farms in China, not <laughs> our holy land. There's a big difference. Right? If your land go back to China, to your farms where you used to follow the sheep there. But uh, the Islamic land is not for them. They occupied these lands, they oppressed the people, they killed a lot of uh, people. Right? But with that we don't support or we don't see it as something correct to stand with the British against them. Same as the, the idea of what happened in our days. <laughs> right? When people stood against certain Governments uh, and supported the Americans and said to them, okay, come. Same thing. Uh, something wrong to, to, to do. You get narrations telling you Allah supports his religion with a kafir and this, that. And you have no sense in politics and you don't know what's, what happens and what's going to happen in the future. That's something very sad to see. Look what's happening until today in, in these places due to the invasion, the American invasion that took place until today. It's a problem. So we don't obviously support anyone who stands with the Western arrogant powers against, uh, the, uh, against people in their, in their countries, even if they are oppressive. So, Muhammad Rashid Rida. Now, being a Salafi and then becoming a, a reformist, يعني, he mixed between some, uh, some weird views and some reformist views. He looked at the, uh, the germs that live on your body, okay? 
what do they call them? Microscope germs or something like that? Well, let's call it microscope germs. <laughs> we'll make a medical name for it, microscope names. Microscope uh, germs. Hello. They say that it's, they are alive, they move, correct? You studied medicine, tell us, Habibi. Yes, yeah, search for it and tell us. So they say that it's, it's alive and they move. If you put the microscope, you'll see these germs moving. Microp creatures or something like that, it's called, right? Yeah, microbes. Microbes, yeah. microbes. So they are living creatures. Bacteria. Bacteria, but they're living, right? They're alive. They're alive, and they move. Alive. Like, what are they if they're alive? <laughs> That's what he said. He said they are type of jinn. <laughs> type of jinn. So do they have a life? Like, are they human? Are they animals? He said, <laughs> he said they are type of jinn that live there. Especially that when, when it comes to the... They are a living organism, yes. But the same thing with plants, for example, it's living organs. Right? Doesn't mean that yani, uh, they are part of the uh, species of jinn. A jinn. Um, so he believed that they are type, a part, part, type of the jinn. Part of the jinn. And a lot of the jinn uh, narrations are linked to purity and impurity, dirt, diseases, and so on. That's what, how he explained it. There's um, also a, a third important point that we mentioned tonight. When it comes to reforming religion, when someone wants to reform religion, it's very important for them to be aware and to be qualified about the traditional views that exist in religion. You can't come and uh, call for reformation and you don't know what religion talks about. You must be qualified. And not only qualified, you must master the traditional thoughts in your religion before you present yourself as a reformist. So not every X and Y stands and says, I want to reform in religion. And he doesn't know how to do wudu. I don't want to say that in something else. He doesn't know how to do wudu. And I say, I want to reform. Why? Because it's something trending. It's something that will make you famous. Right? But you don't know anything about the, your religion. And don't just look at the, the outside appearance if they're wearing a turban. The turban means nothing. Sometimes, as Allah says in the Quran, Kalhimari Yahmiru Aspara. Sometimes you'll see people holding a turban, holding books, but they have no knowledge and no wisdom at all. When you want to reform, you have to be qualified and you have to be in the highest level of qualification before you say, I want to reform. And this is why I always say and repeat that I'm not here to reform the religion. I'm not in a position to reform. I'm not qualified. I'm, I don't, and I'm not in that level where I can present these views. I'm here to learn. And if there's any view when it comes to religion, I present the views of the maraja, our maraja that we respect and we follow. This is something that should be very clear. And I stand against those who want to reform without any evidence. This is why when we come to the Shia scholars, we'll see who the reformists are. Now we have the problem with the term ref reformation or reformers. Well, when we get to that part, we'll, we'll explain why we use this term and so on. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, Sayyid Jamaluddin, they were qualified scholars and in the highest level of qualification. He became the head of the Azhar, Mufti of Egypt. Right? So we're not speaking about random people or any scholar that comes from nowhere and becomes a, a, a scholar. And we said Sheikh Muhammad Abdul comes from a rich family, right? So and he, he wasn't there for money or for any financial gain. We spoke Sayyid Jamaluddin, even when he didn't have any money, he refused to take money from anyone just to stay independent. So these are the, the personality of these scholars. You must be qualified in religion in order for you to present new views. 
it's similar to anything in life. Now, if you want to, let's say, uh, give a stance in, pol in, uh, in politics, you need to know the political theories that exist. If you want to take a stance with or against philosophy, you need to be qualified in philosophy. You see some ignorant people who attack philosophy, right? And they haven't even studied philosophy. But philosophy is kufr. <laughs> they are taking your knowledge from the Greek, uh, Greek philosophers. And half of your usul <laughs> is from the mantiq of the Greek, from the logic of the Greek that you study in the hausa. But philosophy, uh, haram philosophy, right? Kufr. It's these certain families that go around. Why? But they haven't studied philosophy. How are you going? How are you attacking? And I'm not here to say I support or I don't support philosophy. But you have no right to speak if you're not qualified in it. If you don't know ABC in philosophy, how are you taking a stance? If you don't know ABC in Irfan, how are you taking a stance? Wahdatul Wujud. Wallahi, you don't understand what the Wujud is. And you're just attacking Wahdatul Wujud for political reasons. They do it for political reasons. Right? This is a problem. That's why I say to you, don't, um, yani, don't just look at the physical appearance or the outside appearance. Long beard, white, black turban, humbleness means nothing. Means nothing. Look at the evidence that they provide. This is something important. These scholars presented evidence, even with all the unorthodox uh, views that they came up with, they presented evidence. When we spoke about polygamy last week with Sheikh Muhammad Abdul, he presented evidence. Whether we agree or disagree with him, he presented evidence for it. When this scholar speaks about certain things, he also presents evidence to it. طيب. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. So from one side, he was qualified in the highest level of qualification and he has the right to present his views. But when you want to study any scholar, you have to look at his background. Who he was influenced uh, around, who influenced him during his youth time, who influenced him when he was studying, anyone. Now, like, if I look at you, I, I can tell who influenced you at an early age. If I look at you, I know who influenced you in an early age, right? There's people who influenced you. Maybe now you're against them, right? But maybe I'm saying against them, but still. They, they have a certain place in your mind where they affect you in a certain way. If you look at me, also you can find who influenced me at an early age. Okay. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, he was a Salafi when he first started. So no matter how much he changed, this Salafi mentality will stay there somehow. No matter how much I change, this maybe reformist, political, active mentality will stay there. Because the scholars that I was influenced uh, yani, through them, or they influenced me at early age, are all yani, active and political <laughs> scholars. When we look at Lebanon, not yet, of course. Without mentioning the names, so we don't get... <laughs> we don't get in trouble with the names. Rahmatullahi <laughs> alayhim. And may Allah protect the, those who are alive. But maybe one day we'll speak about this change also from the, from the, from the reformist mentality to maybe the extreme mentality that I moved to, then from the extreme mentality to the reformist. Also, there's a process there that also maybe is uh, interesting to speak about it one day. Anyway, Muhammad Rashid Rida. At the end of his life, as we said, he started moving back to the Salafi uh, movement. And he started explaining certain verses, narrations in a very extreme way. For example, when it comes to the verse that says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa man lam yahkum bima anzal Allah, fa'ulaika humul kafirun. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then uh, it is those who are the disbelievers. So according to him, what Allah wants is to establish the Sharia law. Correct? If you call for a secular government as a Muslim, according to him, what would you be classified as? Kafir. Straight away. 
kafir. Why? Because you're not judging based on what Allah wants. Allah says, for example, cut the hand of the, what means cut the hand of the, 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 the one that steals. Right? You want to put him in jail. You're a kafir. You say, I don't understand this uh, view or this verse or this narration. I don't want to apply this narration. Same as some modern scholars today. When I say modern scholars, they don't have to be with Turban. Yani. Those who are interested in the academic or the religious discussion. They say, oh, no, I read, I understand this is a divine religion, but I can't accept this narration. I can't accept this verse. My, my intellect can't make me accept it. You say to him, yani, the maximum that we say to him, that you're wrong, correct? Muhammad Rashid Rasulullah said, okay, Kafir, straight away, Kafir. This mentality opened the way to Salafism to enter into the uh, Reformation movement. So we can say that in the Sunni school of thought, the one that started the Reformation movement in our time is Sayyid Jamaluddin al Afghani, the Shi'i. That comes from a Shia background. The one who continued the reformation and reached the level of becoming the head of the institution is Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, his student. The one who continued after them, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida, who moved from Salafism to, to modernism and from modernism to Salafism. And then he opened the way for extremism and to Salafism to enter into the reformation movement in the Sunni school of thought. And through him, people like Sayyid Qutb became very famous in the reformation movement. Sayyid Qutb, someone who a lot of people admire from Sunnis and Shia. He's considered the philosopher of Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, Sayyid Qutb. Sayyid Qutb, he wasn't a religious scholar. Yani, a traditional religious scholar. He was a, th a thinker, a poet, and then he started re writing about Islam. Obviously, some of his books are good. When you look at his Tafsir al Quran, Fi Dilal al Quran, the way that he put down the Tafsir by starting with the verse, giving an introduction for the verse, and then speaking about the verse, and then Al Bahth al Riwa'i, it was copied by some very important Shia scholars. <laughs> They, did, they used the same method of Sayyid Qutb in the, in the uh, tafsir, without mentioning all the names. So he, he, he had some good views, but at the same time he had some very extreme Salafi views about takfir. Anyone who doesn't believe in this and that is kafir. Sayyid Qutb. And this is why some Western uh, uh, speakers or writers uh, such as Paul Berman. Paul Berman. He refers to uh, Sayyid Qutb as the philosopher of Islamic terror. In the New York Times magazine, 23rd March 2003, uh, he, he mentioned the, the title, it's The Evolution of Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden and Abu Mus'ad Abu Mus al Zarqawi. He believes that Sayyid Qutb was the one that influenced. Terrorism in, in, in the Sunni school of thought. You see how important his name is, that Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida? I mentioned him to show how the Reformation movement started in our era in the Sunni school of thought and how it ended. How it ended. Sayyid Qutb, Muhammad Rashid Rida opened the way in front of Sayyid Qutb and his extreme views. Sayyid Qutb, through his extreme views, opened the way in front of a lot of extreme people to come and join this reformist movement. And you see today how the Muslim, the Sunni school of thought, how, uh, how they are in, in many places. Alhamdulillah, there are some scholars, I don't deny, there are some scholars who are trying to reform today. I don't like to mention the names today, so no one you know, start linking us to, to them, whether in the Sunni or the Shia school of thought. So I don't want to mention any names <clears throat> that are living today. But Alhamdulillah, there are some scholars who are trying to reform in both school of thought, whether the Shia or the Sunnis. But it's very difficult, they became the minority. 
the Reformation movement that became the head of the institution ended up again being a minority in the Sunni school of thought. And this is something very sad uh, uh, to see. Inshallah, this should be enough for the Sunni uh, school of thought. People are not that patient, so we have to hurry up and go to the Shia uh, school of thought.